Hello students, this is Professor Arsenault. I'm recording this little talk on April 27th in the year 2020. This is for the class JMS 200. It is a quick overview of Nielsen TV ratings. You probably, I mean I'm assuming you've heard of Nielsen TV ratings before, but you probably don't know exactly what they mean or how they are computed. My little talk today is going to explain some of the basics, just the most basic, basic aspects of Nielsen TV ratings. Here is some information from today's issue of The Hollywood Reporter. That is a trade magazine for the motion picture and television industry. Is that American Idol had a 1.0 rating among adults aged 18 to 49, 6.04 million viewers overall. The Rookie, by comparison, had a 0.7 rating in 18 to 49, or 4.96 million viewers. Now, what do these numbers mean? Okay, I'm going to break it down for you. At its most basic level, at its most basic fundamental level, a rating is a percent of television households. Okay, so Nielsen takes all the households that have access to television, which includes access to a computer and internet. So even if you don't have a traditional, a quote-unquote traditional television, if you have a laptop or a computer or even a mobile phone and you can access video content, you are considered to be a television household. Let's assume that that's almost 100% of households in America. I know that's not true, but let's just assume that it's almost 100%. Okay, what percentage of those homes watch a particular program? That's basically it. It can also be percentage of people if this is specified. If the number is followed by an age demographic, 18 to 49 is very common, or 18 to 34. If it's followed by something like that, then you know that, okay, American Idol didn't get a 1.0 in television households. American Idol got a 1.0 in that demographic. That means... Everyone aged 18 to 49 in the United States who has access to a television, of that group, 1% of them watched American Idol. Now, share, by comparison, is also a percentage, but we're only looking at the television households who were actually watching television at a certain time period. Similarly, if the share information is followed by an age demographic like 18 to 49, we are only looking at, of the individuals aged 18 to 49, who were actively watching television at that time period. Okay, so ratings and shares are both percentage, but what is that a percent of? That is the variable. Here's a quick example. If we were doing this face-to-face, -face, I would have people respond by raising their hands or using eye clicker, but let's just proceed and imagine we are doing it that way. What's the rating for Channel 2? Three out of ten homes are watching Channel 2. These look like Monopoly homes to me. Three out of ten homes are watching Channel 2. The rating would be 30 or 30 percent. Okay, three out of ten is 30 percent. Now, same graphic. It's exactly the same graphic. What is the share for Channel 2? Three out of six. Three out of six is one half or 50 percent. So the share would be 50, okay, because we're excluding the homes that are not watching television. Now, what is the purpose of all of this data? All of this information that's generated by Nielsen and other ratings companies is used by advertisers. And what they really want to know, I mean, the ultimate goal of this would be some way to track all media usage as well as product purchases. Conceivably, we could have some type of device that would track magazine and print readership, as well as music, as well as radio, as well as video games, as well as video content and film, etc., etc. If you could track that information, then you could determine, say, I'm selling a certain type of toothpaste. What percentage of people who watch American Idol are going to buy my toothpaste? Or what percentage of people who read Entertainment Weekly magazine or who watch ESPN are going to buy my toothpaste? If you could track every form of media usage and every form of product purchasing, you could determine something like this. We are not yet at the world where we can determine anything with that specificity, but that's ultimately what we're trying to get at. 
I also want to take this moment to explain why do Nielsen TV ratings still matter. You may think we are moving into a new world. It's the 21st century. Professor Arsenault, no one watches TV. We binge watch everything on Netflix. I understand. I get that. However, Nielsen television ratings have existed for many, many decades. And as you go out into the world, you are going to be dealing with people who have been used to dealing with Nielsen TV ratings. And I believe that they won't disappear entirely, they will morph or change into something else. So in that way, it's good to know the media industries that you deal with and the type of media you consume. It's good to know the rules that were used to establish those media industries. And then you can have a better sense and understanding of how things are changing and maybe even where we are going to go in the future. Okay, That is what the ultimate goal of audience metrics is, and this is why also I believe it is useful. It is still useful in the year 2020 to understand how television ratings operate, even though they may not operate that way in the future. Where do these ratings come from? Ratings come from samples. You take a small representative sample from the population, maybe 50,000, maybe 100,000 people. We have over 300 million people in the United States. And if you have a small sample, based on that sample, you could extrapolate what the total population was doing. Some of the information comes from electronic devices. Some of the information comes from a diary. And by diary, we literally mean a paper diary. If you are selected to be part of the Nielsen sample, they will ask you to fill out this diary where you record, based on your memory, what you watched. What did you watch last night? What did you watch two days ago? A paper diary is very inexpensive, and it's rather cheap, and you can spread these out and give them to many thousands and thousands of people, although paper diaries aren't considered to be totally reliable because people often don't remember what they watched, or sometimes they may put something that makes themselves look good. For example, I'm an educated college professor. I have a PhD, which is true. I actually do have a PhD. I might be embarrassed for Nielsen to know that I watched um, Guy's Grocery Games, right? A very, very lowbrow show on the Food Channel. So I might be tempted to say, oh, I watched a documentary on PBS. And you can probably put in your own example of something maybe you're a little embarrassed about, but you want to put in something that's more socially acceptable. Now, here is a lesson in sampling, okay? In 1936, FDR had been president already for one term. The magazine Literary Digest predicted, however, that Alf Landon would beat FDR in that year's presidential election. Literary Digest said it would be a 57 to 43% victory, which would be a pretty significant victory for President Landon. The Literary Digest had mailed out over 10 million questionnaires to names. They got the names from people who owned automobiles and people who had telephones, and over 2.3 million people responded. This is actually a very, very big sample. However, at the same time, a young man named George Gallup sampled only 50,000 people. Okay, now bear in mind the Literary Digest had over 2.3 million people respond. George Gallup only has 50,000 people, but he correctly predicted that FDR would win. Why was the discrepancy? Gallup had randomly selected his sample. It was a more representative sample. Literary Digest, by relying on people who owned automobiles and telephones, remember this is back in 1936, not everyone had a telephone, they were over-representing rich people. Rich people back then and today tend to vote more for the Republican Party. So even though the Literary Digest had a much larger sample, it was not a representative sample. So what Nielsen tries to do is get a representative sample. Okay, a quick history lesson. Nielsen audience measurement actually goes back into the early 1940s. A.C. Nielsen, that was his name, A.C. Nielsen, had a device that would leave a paper trail on a piece of paper of what radio station had been tuned. Okay, so they installed this, was called the Audimeter, in 800 homes. A person would come to your home once a week, take the piece of tape so they could see on Monday night, were you listening to this particular radio station? Maybe that was Amos and Andy, Fibber, McGee, and Molly. We could figure out what you were listening to. It actually left an indication on a piece of paper how you had tuned your radio receiver. Also, while the technician is in your home, that technician could also go through your kitchen or go through your pantry 
presumably with permission, and look at what you had purchased. Now, if you recall, the ultimate goal of audience metrics is to match up media consumption with product purchases. It's amazing that in 1942, Nielsen had a primitive system that could do exactly that. They could tell from the audimeter, had you listened to Amos and Andy, that was sponsored by Pepsodent toothpaste, they could look, did you actually buy Pepsodent? So even though we only had 800 homes, I think it's pretty remarkable that the Nielsen radio index had the ultimate system we are trying to reproduce today. The device is then modified so that it can be applied to a television. Just as you could tell what radio station a person had listened to because of a phys physical indication, the same thing was done with television. And then in 1959, something that connected your television to the telephone line came into being, okay? You put these in a certain number of homes and the information is sent automatically to the Nielsen company through the telephone lines. This is the beginning of what we call the overnight ratings. Now you didn't have to wait a week to go in and get the piece of paper. You could get the information and by the next morning they could give you some preliminary, not perfect, but some preliminary results as how many people had watched a television program. Jumping forward a few more decades, now we get the introduction of something called the people meter. Now the previous versions of Nielsen meters could simply tell what station had been on a television, right? Was it on channel two? Was it on channel six, etc.? But it wouldn't tell you who was actually in the room. That's very important. Demographic information about who is actually consuming your media product is extremely, extremely important. So the people meter was introduced. And the way this works, each person in the family or each person in the household has a certain numeric code. The wife has a code, the grandmother has a code, uh, the teenage daughter has a code, etc. So when you walk in the room, you're supposed to press that code, then the television knows, okay, it's the 79-year-old mother-in-law, the 79-year-old grandmother who's in the room, as opposed to the 14-year-old boy who's in the room. You can see how this type of demographic information would be extremely, extremely helpful. Now today, Nielsen uses a combination of electronic devices that are connected to your TV as well as paper diaries. Nielsen has a certain number of families or a certain number of households who have agreed to be part of their sample and their electronic media consumption is actually monitored by these electronic devices. Some of the information is recorded in a diary, that, which means some households don't have the electronic devices and some households do. There is also something that Nielsen has been using for the last few years called a PPM, a portable people meter. This device was originally developed by Arbitron and used to monitor radio usage. Okay? This is a small device, looks something like this, and it works through audio signals. The way it worked with radio was if you were standing in a store and, say, a particular radio station was playing, whether or not you deliberately tried to listen to that radio station, if you were exposed to it, this device would pick up the signal and it would know, hey, you heard 91X, uh, you heard Z90, whatever the radio station might be. Nielsen has since acquired the technology from Arbitron and uses the technology. They still use the technology to monitor radio in this way, but they also use it to monitor television especially out-of-home television viewing. If you are at a bar or a restaurant or a gym or something like that and there's a television playing, this device will pick it up. Nielsen takes all these various sources of data, the paper diaries, the electronic devices, the PPMs, and puts them all together to come up with their Nielsen ratings. Okay, here's a chart from March 9th, some pretty recent statistics. 6.7 rating for NCIS means... Of all the television households in the United States, 6.7% of them watched NCIS. Okay, that's basically what it means. 6.7 is a percentage. If it said 6.7 in 18 to 49, that would mean a 6.7 rating in the demographic people aged 18 to 49. Now, jumping down here at the bottom of this list, we have American Idol. Statistic that I showed at the start of this talk had American Idol with a 1, a 1 is only in that demographic, 18 to 49. So if American Idol is only getting a 1 in 18 to 49, but it's getting a 4.4% overall, what that means is there are a significant number of people 
who are not in the 18 to 49 demographic who are watching American Idol. I know this gets a little confusing, but what this means is that different TV shows can claim we're number one. They're number one in which particular demographic? Are they number one in households? Are they number one in 18 to 35? Are they number one in 18 to 49? It can be different, but you could have multiple TV shows claiming we are number one. All right, now to take it to the next level. We are now looking at DVR usage, okay, delayed viewing. Nielsen goes back after a certain amount of time and they find out what people had watched on their DVRs and then they adjust the numbers for delayed viewing. L plus SD means live plus same day. L plus 7 is live, how many people watched a show live or watched it back within 7 days. And this chart shows the 7 day increase. And here we have a number of shows which are doing extremely well extremely well on DVR. Um, look at this Jersey Shore. More people actually watch it on tape delay than actually watched it live. That's a pretty significant increase. Okay. Now, whenever you look at charts that show increase for DVR viewing, the thing that you never ever see is sports. This is why sports programming is considered to be extremely valuable as we move into this fractured universe where there's a million, literally probably a million different pieces of video content you could choose from. People watch sports the day that it airs, if not exactly when it airs in real time, okay? If you didn't watch the Super Bowl when it aired, you cannot wait a week to catch up. You're going to know that evening who won, whether you like it or not, because people will be texting and screaming. It'll be all over the news. So sports is extremely, extremely valuable programming. Just a quick overview. Here are some terms which you might want to know moving forward. L plus SD, L plus 3, L plus 7, and then also the C3. C3 is a rating for the commercial, not the entire program. C3 looks specifically at the commercial breaks, also known as commercial pods, how many people watched the ads when the program aired and within three days of delayed viewing. There is actually an ongoing debate within the television industry right now as to how much delayed viewing should be counted. Some people say seven days is too long. Other people say seven days is not long enough and that you really ought to include 29 or 30 days of viewing. Things are likely going to change as more and more delayed viewing takes place and as people watch on different platforms. Now, I have not talked about Netflix and Hulu and Amazon, these other ways of streaming video content. This chart here, OTT, by the way, stands for over the top. That is more or less a synonym for television or video that is provided over the internet. Netflix is the big player in this field. Netflix is the big player but how many people watch Netflix and Hulu and, and Amazon? The answer is we really don't know, okay? Netflix and Amazon, these companies have their own metrics for tracking viewership, and they deliberately keep them secret. So when Netflix says Tiger King was the most popular show last month, you kind of have to take their word for it, okay? Because we don't really know how they're calculating that. There are some indication that Netflix counts two minutes of viewing. If you start a program and leave it on for two minutes and then click out of it, that show is going to be counted. Is two minutes long enough? Maybe, maybe not. The point is that we really don't know how these streaming platforms calculate viewership. As an overview, ratings and shares are percentages. If you want to go back, look at the earlier slide. That might refresh your memory. The info that Nielsen uses comes from a sample of viewers. Nielsen does not really know what all 315 or 320 million people in the United States are watching. They are just guesstimating based on a sample. And the information comes from electronic devices, including the PPM device, and some of it comes from paper diaries. So there you have it, an overview of Nielsen TV ratings. Hopefully you learned a little something from this.